Hey, 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 friends and listeners, welcome back to Truth, Lies, and Alibis, your true crime podcast that looks at things from the distinct perspective of two 911 dispatchers. Episode 13, Unbreakable. Today I finished telling Jess about the hammer killer and the many lives he altered forever. So to start off today's episode, I'm going to go over our last episode just to recap so you can be all caught up. We talked about August 9th, 1984, when Nancy Berry and Chris Berry are attacked by an intruder with a broken axe handle and how their attacker was caught when he made a call to his brother on a payphone talking about a prison break because he had just broken out of prison when he was being transported from Utah to Arizona to go to court for a crime he committed, another attack in Kingman, Arizona. And that victim was Roy Williams, who was attacked on January 27th, 1984. And then we went into how Ewing had been sentenced to 110 years in prison, but he only served 33. And he was really looking forward to getting out because he had already started a dating profile and was looking for an outdoorsy woman. Great. And how his DNA... Right before that links him to a string of attacks in Colorado, which leads us to the January 4th, 1984 attack of newlyweds Kim and Jim Hobbenshield, who were attacked when an unknown subject entered their house through an open garage and attacked them with a hammer. And then he fled. And then on January 10th, just six days later, Patricia Smith is attacked while she's eating lunch by a subject who enters through the open garage and attacks her. Then, the same day that Patricia was found, Donna Holm is attacked in Aurora, Colorado, 25 miles away from Patricia, and she's also beaten with a hammer and sexually assaulted and left. And then that led us up to where we talked about how Donna recovered and she went back to work and kind of how all of the people's lives had been affected so far. So, I told you it's only going to get worse, so here we go. We're just going to dive right in. (laughs) On January 15th, 1984, so if you'll remember, the last attack occurred January 10th, did I say? Yeah, January 10th. So this is five days later. On January 15th, 1984, the Bennett family celebrated Melissa Bennett's upcoming eighth birthday. 27-year-old Bruce Bennett, 26-year-old Deborah Bennett, 7-year-old Melissa, and her 3-year-old sister, Vanessa Bennett, as well as Bruce's mother and two brothers, have cake, sing happy birthday, and enjoy time as family. When Bruce's mother and two brothers leave, one of the brothers reminds Bruce that his garage door is open. However, it doesn't appear that Bruce ever closed it. The family had just moved into their brand new home two months before this evening. And in the early morning hours of January 16th, 1984, between midnight and 6 a.m., an unknown intruder entered the Bennett family home through the unlocked garage door. It appears that he confronted Bruce at the top of the stairs, beating him, cutting his throat, and murdering him before he continued to the master bedroom where Deborah Bennett is. He brutally beats her and sexually assaults her. He then went into the bedroom of seven-year-old Melissa and three-year-old Vanessa. He brutally beats the girls and sexually assaults both of them. Yep. He then goes through the master bedroom, dresser drawers, Deborah's purse, and exits the home. The next day, when Bruce and Deborah fail to show up at work, the family furniture warehouse where they work at, one of their co-workers calls Bruce's mom and asks, have you heard from them? She hadn't heard from them. So she goes to the home to check on the family. She notices as she arrives that the garage door is open. When she walks inside, she finds the body of her son, Bruce, at the end of the stairway. There's blood everywhere, and she calls the police. When they arrive, they see that there are bloody handprints at the top of the stairs, and there appears to have been a struggle. It appears that Bruce fought his attacker in a desperate attempt to protect his wife and baby girls. So it looks like the attack happened at the top of the stairs, and he fought... But then fell down the stairs, and that's Mm. where he's found at the end of the stairs, deceased. One of the officers describes the scene on People Investigates as the most graphic crime scene ever and states, we're dealing with something evil because it was such a slaughterhouse. Yeah, it definitely sounds like it. Police then find Deborah Bennett in the master by the bed, covered in blood, naked from the waist up. There's a claw hammer impression in the blood next to her body. However, from some of the stuff I read, they didn't ever find the hammer. When police enter the girls' room, there's blood everywhere. The body of seven-year-old Melissa is on the ground with her face up, hands above her head. It appears that her attacker cut her PJs off 
before sexually assaulting her. She has defensive wounds on her hands, and under her body is a utility knife. I'm trying to get through this without being graphic because it's just heartbreaking. The girl's comforter and teddy bear are also soaked in blood, and in the carpet under Melissa's body, the investigators find semen. Vanessa is on the bed between the bed and the wall. She is struck numerous times with a hammer and is covered in blood. Miraculously, she is alive and transported to the children's hospital. Remember, she's three years old. Doctors yeah. don't think she will survive. She has blows to the skull, arms, and legs, a shattered jaw, shattered arms, legs, ankles, and pelvis. She's God, in a coma she, and, for weeks and wakes up with wow. no memory of the crime. Jeez. Yeah. Donations for her medical bills pour in after the media tells her story and her grandma takes her in. Police investigate the crime scene for days. They go door to door to see if anyone in the neighborhood saw or heard anything the night of the murder and they can't find one witness. Outside the home, they find Deborah's purse, a large butcher knife in the snow, and they determine the knife was what was used to kill Bruce. They send the prints out to Aphis, but none were ID'd. They collect bloody carpets and the semen and send it to the CBI to be analyzed. At this time, however, the only thing they can't analyze is blood type, and they determine the killer's blood type is type A. Not a lot. No. Deborah was described as a great mom to the girls. Bruce, who served in the U.S. Air Force and was in the reserves, is described as an all-around family man and hard worker, and they had worked really hard to buy this home for their family. Investigators begin linking the hammer crimes together and realize that the attacker has attacked every week for three weeks straight. They reach out to the FBI for assistance with profiling the case, and an investigator comes to Colorado to walk the crime scene and go through the records. Their profile connects all four attacks because of the clear MO. It's a crime of opportunity, as we stated in the last episode. They enter through an open garage and attack their victim immediately to surprise them. He takes only low-value items that are easy to carry and conceal, and the profile describes him as, and these are quotes, sloppy and unsophisticated. They determine that the killer is likely a white young male in his 20s at the time. He is most likely, another quote, ordinary and not very smart or college-educated. They think that he is probably a construction crew member as there are various construction jobs around the crime scenes because all of them are newer builds Mm, or near a newer build. Mm -hmm. Aurora PD uses this information to check with construction crews in the area. They go through pages and pages of names and information but determine they have nothing to go on to form a solid lead because they're construction workers. Some of them would do a job and just leave or would just leave during a job. The community lived in fear for years, unsure if the killer was still in the area. In the People Investigates documentary, they even said that some people were sleeping with helmets on because they were so worried they would be attacked with hammers during the night. The biggest lead they had was the semen from the Bennett murder and the fingerprints and that the killer is blood type A. However, that doesn't get them very far. Investigators feel like they are, and this is a quote, chasing a ghost, and when detectives re-examine the case later... Years later, in the evidence, they find that there is hair that they never collected before and never tested in the evidence. It's, like, on the comforter. Hmm. It's the only hair they find, but they determine they need to run it, even though there's a risk the hair might not be usable after. They run the test and, of course, get no usable evidence, and it's just gone. They Hmm. can't reuse it. On March 1st, 2001, 17 years after the Bennett murders, the CBI run a full genetic sequence through CODIS and there was no match because of the progress they've made in DNA. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't until 34 years later in 2018 when the CBI got a match on the DNA. The hammer killer is determined to be Alex Christopher Ewing. With DNA evidence, they had to push to have this DNA collected along with other prisoners because of the backlog. So, Five years prior to this, Nevada had passed a new law requiring all offenders to be DNA tested. So everyone Mm -hmm. who was in prison had to have their DNA collected. And they actually had to push this and they had to push for them to get all of it in the system. It was like a long process. Luckily, it did at the time, right? Or they wouldn't have gotten this match and he might have gotten out. Mm, God only knows what he would have done, where he would have gone. What would have happened? Right. Detective Connor and Prosecutor Kellner travel to Nevada to question Ewing. When they walk in and see him for the first time, Prosecutor Kellner sees right through his frail appearance. He said, this is a quote, this guy is pretending to be a frail man. They start the interview slowly, not releasing information on why they are actually there. He tells them about his childhood. He says that his dad was in the Air Force and he dropped out of high school. He had spinal meningitis and said that after that, his personality changed 
I read some studies on this and some of them say that like one third of children with meningitis have behavioral issues after or some kind of change in their mental abilities. So I don't think that's an excuse for murder, but it nope. does happen. Ewing also had a criminal history. He'd been arrested on a charge of burglary in California in 1979. That same year, he was arrested for burglary in Florida and also arrested on charges of grand theft and burglary in Arizona, which I'm like, what the fuck? How is he? Yeah. (laughs) In one year, how are you getting around and doing so many crimes and not like staying in jail? Yeah. Yeah. In 1980, he's also arrested for burglary in California again. In 1981, California authorities used a fugitive arrest warrant against him. And in 1982, again, he's charged in California for criminal trespass and burglary. So he has a pretty extensive history. He tells them that he was in Colorado for some time, and they quickly determined that he was there for about a year around the time of the attacks, and that he worked as a construction worker... And as you'll remember, the FBI profiler had determined that the killer was possibly a construction worker as the attacks happened in areas of new construction. Can I just pause and say, like, so profiling specifically is what, once I spent some years in college trying to figure out what direction I wanted to go into, it's one of the reasons I went into psychology. Profiling specifically is why I went into psychology, because it's fascinating, right, that and, and not all profiling is accurate, and I'm not talking about racial profiling or gender profiling or anything like that, but specifically coming down to the fact that, uh, like, has a lower education, works for construction because of, it, like, going off of evidence as well as pulling, like, what common threads point to as far as behavior. Mm-hmm. And that, to me, has always been super fascinating. That's why I loved watching, like, Criminal Minds and stuff. I fell off eventually there's too many episodes of it now but (laughs) but i mean it was why i decided to go into psychology was for criminal profiling because that's so fascinating to me that they can look at specifically look at a group of crime that they believe is committed by a single person and be able to determine based off of human behavior narrow it down to like it's This person does this, this, and this. Yeah. Yeah. They're high school educated. They probably do hands-on jobs. They're a loner or they're awkward or they live with their mom or vice versa. (laughs) Like it's not always that, right? That they're very charming and Mm -hmm. they make friends well. Everybody says they're, that they're the life of the party. Like they're able to determine that stuff too. Yeah. Yeah. And it's always, always been so fascinating to me. It's fascinating, especially when it turns out to be right. Like, yeah, you're like, how did you know that? (laughs) Like, how did you get there? Yeah, Yeah, I agree. That's why I like Criminal Minds, too. But also, like you, I have not seen every episode. And um, what was that show that only got like two seasons? Mindhunter? Oh, yeah. Mindhunter was a good one, too. And it was based on the true story. Yeah. The two guys that initiated the behavioral analysis unit. Yes. That one was a good one, too. So... When they finally tell him why they're there, he gets really angry and closes down. They collect another DNA sample to rerun and determine that he is, in fact, the hammer killer. On August 7th, 2018, police called the victims to tell them that they had finally found the killer. At this time, Vanessa lived under a bridge in Tucson, Arizona, when a reporter called to tell her that the killer was ID'd. Vanessa had struggled her entire life with heroin and other drugs to numb her pain, She was homeless and had survivor's guilt and had attempted suicide because of severe depression. On August 9th, 2018, an arrest warrant was issued for Alex Ewing for the Bennett murders. They decide to try him for the murder of Patricia Smith after the Bennett trial has ended. And Alex Ewing fights extradition for almost two years all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. But the state of Colorado wins and Ewing is extradited to Colorado. D.A. Kellner told People Investigates that almost everything about a cold case is harder than a regular case and Mm -hmm. states that the first challenge they had to overcome was the statute of limitations on the assaults against Jim, Kim, and Donna. They would not be able to get justice for any of those crimes. Um, In one of the articles I read, they suggested that Donna pushed to be a victim of kidnapping because she was kind of like held there against her will, I think. But her husband was like, no, I don't want to put her through that. Like, it's not worth it to put her through that. They would not be able to get justice for the sexual assaults, even against the Bennett's because the statute of limitations, which I'm like, 
what the fuck why is that a thing crazy to me yeah it should not even be just a stay thing. hidden for long enough yeah it's insane and it's yeah. just because it's been so long somebody doesn't get justice for what happened to them especially when the technology wasn't there right yeah it's just kind of sickening i feel angered by it <laughs> i also feel angered by it i feel so much anger so so much anger D.A. Kellner personally prosecutes the case to see it through for all the victims and people who worked on the case. He says, like, he could have delegated it to someone else, but he felt like he had to see it through. Yeah. The judge blocks evidence of the prior crimes in Nevada and Arizona and Donna and Kim's attack as well, probably due to the statute of limitations. However, I don't know why they couldn't bring up the crimes he had served time for. Right. The judge does rule that they can talk about Patricia because this shows his M.O., which I'm like... Shouldn't it be, like, backwards since he hasn't been charged with Patricia's murder yet? And uh, we've talked about the whole, like, our justice system works on innocent to proven guilty, which we've seen is not the case across the board Mm -hmm. in previous cases that we've talked about. But it's like when you know that somebody is guilty of these and you're taking them to court not to necessarily prove guilt, but to determine sentencing... Again, it's just touching back on the statute of limitations that it's just like this man committed these terrible, terrible things and we're not going to charge him with him because it's been too long. Yeah. Like that that's that's shame on the justice like shame on the justice system for not being able to catch him. You know what I mean? That like sure they didn't have the evidence, but that's not the victim's fault. No. That they weren't able to catch this man. Who cares? He obviously didn't change. He went on to commit crimes that were violent and the same mo it's it's obviously relevant to why he's in court yeah and then to say because we couldn't catch him in time you right. cannot use that yes. even though we know for a fact that it was him yeah it, that's infuriating obviously can you tell <laughs> <laughs> this whole case is kind of it's awful um on july 27th 2021 so not too long ago the trial began Detective Brandt testifies and Ewing just stares him down. He says he looked evil. He says he didn't have any kind of emotion the whole time. I wouldn't imagine he would. Yeah. No. Ewing's attorney argues DNA from 1984 was mishandled and tampered with, which I'm like, how did they know how to mishandle and tamper with it? Like, they didn't even know the power of DNA. The only thing they've got to argue (laughs) on, right? Like... They try to confuse the jury with this and argue the hair can't be used that could determine it wasn't Ewing because that was mishandled because they tried to test the hair. D.A. Kellner argues that DNA evidence could conclusively determine that the defendant was the murderer. Ewing denies ever being in the house, which is good for the D.A. because he fires back with, then how did the evidence get there? Yep. How is your semen in the house? There is a week of testimony and deliberations last an entire day when the jury tells the judge they are at an impasse. He insists that they go back, rest, and return the next day to continue deliberations. The next day at midday, they come back with a verdict and they rule that he is guilty. Thank goodness. Yeah. Jeez. Vanessa gets to read a victim's impact statement and says, I didn't just lose my sister and parents. I lost my trust in people. I lost my dignity and pride. I lost the person who I was supposed to be. I lost my sanity. She says she always felt that the void of having no one there to support her or that she could talk to, even though her grandmother took her in after the crime, they didn't really talk about it. Probably because it was too hard to talk about. Yeah, right. Kellner told People Investigates, I'll never forget seeing Vanessa, who was scarred as a three-year-old, lying in her little bed covered in blood with a teddy bear laying in bed next to her. She survived that onslaught, and to see her get up at sentencing and really look evil in the eye and have her final peace, it's why I do this job. In August 2021, Alex Ewing was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences for the murders of the Bennett family. At the news briefing, they credit Nevada Attorney General Adam Lexalt because he, in 2016, had issued an opinion to enforce a 2013 state law requiring the Nevada Department of Corrections to log inmate DNA samples in CODIS, regardless of conviction date. So without him pushing for that, Ewing's DNA never would have been collected, wouldn't have been in the system. He could have gotten out. One, there could have been no justice. Like we already said, who knows what else he would have done. That's the scary thing is he was like, what, less than a year from being released, slipping through their fingers again. Yeah. And a spokesperson by the name of Bob Harmon said, it illustrates the importance of these DNA programs and going back to doing this retroactive work. You don't know what you're going to find. And in this case, it was very significant. 
In April of 2022, Ewing is convicted of murder or a felony murder during sexual assault and robbery and sentenced to another life sentence after a second five day trial. They link Alex Ewing through semen and hair evidence. And this is for the murder of Patricia Smith. 34 years of mystery, sadness, grief, and fear has finally come to a point of foreseeable and hopeful conclusion for my family and me. This is Joe Reese, the grandson of Patricia, his statement. He describes his grandmother as a beacon of light, a vibrant inspiration of love and laughter to everyone she met, and says it is difficult to imagine how much more fulfilling our lives would have been if Patricia Smith's life had not been taken from us. It's more difficult to imagine her death remaining a mystery. There is some Mm. relief. That's, I think, something that I don't think maybe gets forgotten, but doesn't always get touched on as much. The fact that these people that commit these crimes and, like, take lives, that's not their only victim. It's a ripple effect that affects family, that affects friends, that affects, you know, like, even depending on what that person did as, like, a job. Who knows what they could have done had they still been around. And strangers that they didn't meet yet, that they could have changed their lives. And All it's the like good that they could have done. Erasing their potential from existence affects much more than just that person. It truly is like a drop of water into a lake and those ripples go out. Yeah. After hearing her attacker was also the hammer killer, Nancy Berry says, I thought about all those families and how traumatic that was for them and that that could have been us. I know where he is. I can't imagine. That's my thoughts. I can't imagine the devastation those families have gone through and how they've been haunted for all these years. So if you'll remember, Nancy, like, he served time for what he did to her Mm -hmm. already. But she's saying, like, just to know that there was other victims and they had been living in fear and living with uncertainty for all those years. And also, like, what a haunting realization to know that had she not been able to get that call out to 911... The, like, true horror that this man is capable of. Mm -hmm. The fact that... They would be dead. They, yeah. And their children, too, probably. Probably, yes. When the Hobbin Shields learn of the arrest, it brings some comfort. Although the two separate and starred families since, they lived in fear for many years. And this is a quote from Nine News. Mr. Hobbin Shields said, You know, I don't sleep much at night anymore because of that. If I hear noises or anything, I'm up all night. And it's not just at bedtime. He's also scared when he was in public. He would say, it's always there in the back of my mind. You know, even when you go out to restaurants and wherever you go, you always wonder if he was still out there because he would know who we were, but we wouldn't know who he was. Yeah. Kim, now Rice, found comfort in believing that her attacker was dead. Knowing now that her attacker was found and will spend life in prison offers her some comfort. Vanessa Bennett told People that while Ewing is serving four consecutive life sentences and will not be released, she is sentenced to a lifetime of emotional and physical pain. When she was growing up, it was difficult to be a, quote, normal kid because she was always living with her injuries and she said kids never wanted to hang out with her or have sleepovers because they would tease her and tell other kids, don't go to her house, the hammer man is going to get you. That's awful. Kids are so cruel. We've talked about this before. Kids (sighs) suck sometimes. Just raise your kids to be better people. (sighs) She thinks of her mother, father, and sister every day, and she wonders what her life would have been like if he hadn't taken them from her. With the killer being found and prosecuted, Vanessa feels like she is finally able to start healing. She told people in the past few years she is finally getting clean and has moved into an apartment with her third husband, Frankie, and their cat. She said, I've had bumps along the way, but I have big dreams, and these big dreams she mentioned are dreams of a house with a yard, a college degree, which she's working on, and she wants to be a drug counselor. She feels a responsibility to others who are struggling and shares her story. And this is a quote. My strength is all I have to share. I tell my story to lift people up. I am unbreakable. I am a survivor. Oh, I got chills. Ewing didn't address the court or release any statements. His legal team plans to appeal his convictions. Good luck. Mm -hmm. And that is the story Of the hammer killer. And like you said, I thought it was important to kind of add the little bits that I could find about the victims later, the victims Mm -hmm. who survived, the survivors, because Mm -hmm. I don't think Mm -hmm. that people really stop to think about. Like, yeah, true crime is fascinating because you, like you said, you're like thinking about why people are the way they are or thinking about how profiling can lead to an arrest or how amazing DNA evidence is. 
Right. But it's also terrifying in the fact that, like he said, they would go out in public and they would be like, is my attacker here? could be anybody. Yeah. He knows who I am, but I don't know who he is because like many times we've discussed before, the unknown is scarier than knowing, right? Yeah. And then just to have to live with that. Not only the physical wounds, the physical stuff that they have to go through, but the mental, the emotional. Vanessa was three years old. Doesn't remember her attack, but her physical... Yeah, her physical impairments, the way people treated her, which is... Mm -hmm. That's just not okay. Yeah. But also, like, her drug use because she needed comfort, how she thinks about all the things she lost, how she wasn't allowed to talk about what happened to her, really. The survivor's guilt. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's just, like, heartbreaking. And growing up knowing, like, my family died, I'm here. I never get to know them. Yeah. And like she said, he stole the life that she was supposed to have. Yeah. A completely different timeline of what that future looked like for her. Yeah. So I thought it was important to mention that because I don't think people really stop to think about how many lives are affected, like you said, from one person. One person's actions can ruin so many people's lives. Yeah. It's heartbreaking and it's disgusting because fuck him. And I think that's one of the things that we do well, or we try to at least, we can always improve. There's always room for improvements. But I think it's one of the things we try to do well here where we give a moment and we give the light to the victim because a lot, I think, A lot of true crime focuses on, it's hard to focus on anything else other than the perpetrator because they're the one that did this awful thing. And so the whole story is about them, you know? Yeah. But it is important to either like put aside a moment to like think about it and how those lives are affected and like, like they're owed that, like the victims are owed that. We take the time to talk about this disgusting piece of trash that did this to them we owe it to them to talk about them too Mm -hmm. and i think that's why early on we decided not to share pictures of Mm -hmm. the attacker not to like shine even more light on them i think the only quote-unquote bad guys that we have really shared pictures of was the nexium cult and that's only because really that's only the pictures that they have out there linked to them right yeah i think also hh holmes because the mustache. We yes. had to the mustache. And because that crime was such a long time ago. <laughs> Again, yeah. there was yeah. no really anything else that we could share to kind of yeah. link to the case. But I know we talked about it early on how we didn't want to be... To glorify them. Yeah. Because that's not fair to the survivors or the victims or the victims' families. And yeah. that's not why I have an obsession with true crime. <laughs> One, I am fascinated with why but also like watching watching Vanessa Mm -hmm. that's like like how and how that prosecutor was like this is why I do what I do like for the justice of it and yeah and that's part of the reason why I did wanted to be a dispatcher right was to help people in like their worst times that's why I became a picky nurse so I could kind of relate to that and to watch her it was just heartbreaking but it was also like encouraging to see that she's finally able because she has some form of closure not completely because when something like that happens you never really move on yeah but because she finally found the attacker she felt like oh i can finally start my healing process right you know and to see her get those wins after just going through so much for so long Mm -hmm. to finally and again like even for the couple kim and jim or kim and tim i just remember that their names rhymed yeah kim and jim hobbenshield jim okay so like even for that couple even that weight to come off their shoulders that this man that did this is finally put away and you know kim had convinced herself she did what she needed to, to do to move on and be like oh well he's probably dead you know if you're in that place whatever gets you through the day absolutely but to finally get official word that like yeah he's going away and he's never getting out mm-hmm. there's no 110 years this time and getting out in 30 there's no parole yeah yeah the fact that like how that first breath after that must have felt Mm -hmm. to be able to like maybe for the first time in a long time be able to take the deepest breath and just exhale all that tension out i can't imagine another thing that i thought about was like i have taken calls where people were being attacked but not 
obviously not anyone who's being hit with a hammer. Right. Just like thinking about all the calls that you take, I guess, too. Like, just like the other day I took a DV call and I could hear the mom being beat. And like, Mm. for some reason that I think I told you that call stuck with me and it just made me cry. But there are calls that stick with you forever. And I'm sure that call was one that stuck with that dispatcher forever. Yeah. And And how that looked different back then, right? how Mm -hmm. precise you have to be and how much more information you had to get back in the 80s because we couldn't rely on technology back then that she had to give an address yeah massive props go to nancy and that dispatcher for being able to communicate well in that time of heightened while she's actively being beat with a hammer yeah Yeah. It's it's incredible we are pretty lucky that nowadays we have at least when it works which is more times than not usually now yeah but that we have the ability to find oh, okay. somebody, even if they're not in a position where they can be like, I am here. This is what's happening. I need this right now. Yeah. It's crazy. I'm glad they found him. It's also just crazy to think about how long it took. And it literally, his trial, like, just happened. Yeah, that's crazy. Like, two years ago. I had never I was gonna... heard of this story. <laughs> I was about to say, I hadn't heard anything about it. But when do I? <laughs> Like we always say, I tell Jessica about the crimes she knows nothing about. I don't know anything about them. (laughs) Before I read this article, though, I knew nothing about this. And then I was like, I have to know everything. So then I watched the documentary and then I watched the YouTube videos. And then I went down a rabbit hole with all of the research. And I was like, holy crap. How did I not know about the story? Well, and thank goodness for the people that do push those local legislative laws that like, no, we need to get everybody in the system for DNA and Dakotas and stuff like that, because there are countless cold cases that will never get solved. Yep. But if there's a 5% chance that that guy, that that perpetrator is still in jail and they can catch his dna run it through the system and it pings to a a cold case Mm -hmm. phenomenal yeah and hopefully with all the changes like that there will be far less cold cases in the future with not only collecting dna in prison but the familial dna that they can use now yeah hopefully it'll help like I said, DNA is just kind of this amazing thing. And thank God that we've made so much progress and can tell more than a blood type. Science! <laughs> and thank God people actually hung on to stuff. Right. And didn't just yeah. like get rid of it. Be like, well, we can't do anything with this. So yeah, this is useless to us. Yeah. But sorry for the bummer, Jess. <laughs> thank <laughs> this you. This one was definitely more of a bummer than all the other ones that you've called bummers. This well, one's anything definitely... with children is that much harder, I feel like, for me. Yeah. Like, it takes somebody truly disgusting to commit any of these crimes, right? But it takes somebody truly disgusting to sexually assault a child. Yeah. And the fact that he sexually assaulted all three of them. Yeah. And then just left them for dead. And that's the, I was going to comment on earlier, is the fact that we've talked, too, about how people like this escalate and Mm -hmm. who knows what those next crimes would have looked like if he hadn't messed up yeah because he was already getting the worst of the worst right to go from bludgeoning to in that circumstance to kill the man by cutting his throat with a knife and in such a short amount of time too yeah and literally he started with burglary and also like it makes me wonder too like did he start before this Did he start in California? Did he start in Florida? Did people look into any kind of unsolved crimes there that maybe they didn't have DNA for because they didn't really know DNA was a thing? Because it just seems like such a huge jump from burglary to beating someone to death with a hammer. Yeah. Or unsolved rapes or, you know what I mean? There's probably stuff maybe they should look into. Maybe they will. I don't know. But it just seems like a really far leap from just burglary to right. raping and killing right. people but maybe it just escalated over time and maybe something happened around them and he was just like yep this isn't doing it for me anymore this is what i'm gonna do and maybe he did it the first time and he was like i actually really like this so i'm just right. gonna keep doing it yeah but i'm thrilled to hear about vanessa finally able to be comfortable enough and secure enough to like get her life like back on track yeah to be able to take control of her life back i just hope she gets all the things she wants out of life we're rooting for you vanessa good luck 
Thank you for listening. Additional information for each case can be found on our website, truthliesandalibis.buzzsprout.com. New episodes will be uploaded every Monday. Find us on Facebook and Instagram at Truth Lies and Alibis.